Okay. Um, since we're nearing the end of the semester, I just want to make a couple of comments uh, about our scheduling. We get yeah, this this is the last regular week of the semester, and the uh, December 9th at this time will be the last exam, and it's just on chapter 18, electrochemistry. Um, the problem is I introduced the subject today and there's no room for review, but I do have a uh, review video that I made in the spring, and you can uh, check that out between now and uh, next Monday. Oh yeah, yeah. The review documents are there also, right? Um, so you'll have to check the. Uh, you have to go on Blackboard and uh, view the review uh, recording and documents. And I'm going to be here every day. So if you need to contact me on a, a specific problem, then. Uh, we could even set up a, a private Zoom session, either from here or from home. If I happen to be home, you contact me. I can uh, I can Zoom with you and uh, solve any specific problems. Okay, let's see. And our last lab is today, which will be we're going to build a battery. Two types of batteries. But I'm not going to say a whole lot about that right now because we haven't even introduced the topic yet. <clears throat> okay. Let's put this away and get on to chapter 18. Let's see. Refresh Berkeley. Where we look again. Okay, <clears throat> electrochemistry. We know what the chemistry is all about. Electro refers to uh, electrons. So any type of chemistry that takes place where electrons are transferred, then you can bet it uh, fits in this topic. <clears throat> but it goes a little bit deeper than that. It also studies the uh, transferability of electrical energy to from chemical energy. So we investigate the, the connection between uh, chemical energy uh, and electrical energy that can be derived from it. Uh, remember, read, we have talked about redox, haven't we? I think we have. A redox reaction uh, occurs whenever electrons are transferred. And remember what, uh, uh, how to remember uh, 
oxidation is lost, and that's loss of electrons, and reduction is gain of electrons. Okay, so there's your little mnemonic. <clears throat> Here we go. So when we talk about um, oxidation reduction reactions, they can be written out as the entire reaction, but this doesn't tell you right, you can't see immediately which part of the reaction is involved in reduction, which part is involved in oxidation. Um, and also something else you may notice about this equation is uh, it's missing some components, right? You would expect a cation to be associated with that anion, and it could be this one, but it doesn't have to be. And that cation could be associated with some other anion. And they usually are. <clears throat> um, so what that should tell you is that those missing components are just spectators. We don't need them to balance the equation. We don't need them to study the reaction. Uh, any spectator will do. Right, so this could be ammonium um, manganate. This could be uh, iron to chloride, for all I know. But the way you deal with an equation like this is you break it up into its half reactions. And what we mean by half reaction is um, there two parts of the same reaction, one is dedicated to reduction and the other is dedicated to oxidation. Now, how do we know and how do we express oxidation and reduction in an equation? Since reduction is gain and the reactions are generally written from left to right, the electrons are gonna be on the left-hand side because they're they are added to or gained by some other reactant on that side of the equation, and then they don't show up on the product side. So that's the reduction equation. You have the electrons on the left-hand side, and the oxidation, you'll have the electrons on the product side because they've been lost by some reactant. And this is just, uh, this just breaks the equation, this equation up into two separate ones. And notice that when we write the reduction and oxidation reactions, we include the electrons. But when we combine them, the electrons disappear. If we were to go backwards and add this equation to that equation, then this part's on the right-hand side, this part's on the left-hand side, they cancel out. So it's only with the half reactions or with actually studying uh, the equation that you know how many electrons were transferred in the process. It's important to know that not yet, but in the future, we're going to be talking about um, things like um, electrolysis, or we're going to be plating out metals. We're going to be driving reactions in reverse. And you have to know how many electrons are transferred uh, in order to do those calculations. But that'll come. Okay, so if we're given an equation that's not balanced, um, and we've determined that electrons are transferred, or you're told that they are transferred. That's typically what we do in, uh, in an exam. Just tell you the equation is unbalanced and electrons are transferred, then how do you balance the equation? And we use the method of half reactions. These are the steps, but of course, it's probably going to make more sense if we just do one. So if we take this one, I'm going to take this one and go through the steps of balancing this equation. Okay. So if we're given this equation, uh, dichromate ion. Then aqueous solution, then the sulfide ion, and 
yield chromium 3 in aqueous solution and sulfate in aqueous solution. Okay, now we have to decide um, how the electrons are transferred and which reaction is oxidation and which one can get reduction. The only way to know that is to calculate the uh, oxidation states of each one. Remember, if you have uh, just a single element ion, that is the oxidation state. So this one's already given to you, it's three plus. But these we have to calculate. So we know that oxygen is always two minus. So seven times two minus is 14 minus. And we have to reserve two minuses for that charge. So we really only have to balance 12 minuses with the chromium. So if the chromium is balanced at 12 plus, and you have two of them, each one is six plus. So the oxidation state on that chromium is six plus. The oxidation state on this chromium is three plus. We know then that the electrons have been transferred. Uh, how about this sulfur? Same thing, oxygen is two minus, so three times two minus is six minus. We hold out two minuses for that charge. That means that sulfur is four plus. And we do the same thing for this side. That's the oxidation state for chromium there. So this is eight minus, we hold out two. This is six plus. So the oxidation state for that sulfur is six plus. Now we have to decide which one's oxidation and which one's reduction. Okay, so oxidation is a loss. So which one lost electrons? This one went from six plus to three plus. It had to gain electrons, right? So this is the oxidation rule, the SO3, right? And this is four plus oxidation state and yields uh, sulfate with its six plus oxidation state, okay? And since that's oxidized, we have a four plus, six plus, that means it lost two electrons at this stage of the game. So that means what's left over? Uh, chromate, dichromate at six plus here, went to chromium, three plus, right? But we had to add three electrons for that. Okay, now that we've got our oxidation and reduction reactions separated, half reactions. The next step is to balance everything that's not oxygen or hydrogen. Do that first. One sulfur, one sulfur, that's balanced. Two chromium, we need two chromium here. Okay, now the chromium is balanced, sulfur is balanced. <clears throat> the next thing you balance is oxygen. You balance oxygen by adding water. So if we have one oxygen here and four there, that means we need an oxygen on this side. There's your one oxygen. So now we have four oxygens on this side, four oxygens on that side. How about this one? This one has seven oxygens here, so we need seven oxygens on this side in the form of water, seven H2Os. Next, you balance with hydrogens, protons, H pluses. So that means that if, that if those hydrogens remain in that solution, that it's acidic, right? And uh, there are two ways to balance equations, either in acidic solution or basic solution. We always start with the acidic. And I'll show you what to do for the basic after. 
So now, how many hydrogens do we have here? We've got two hydrogens on this side. We need two on this side as protons. This one, we have 14 hydrogens on that side. So we need 14 hydrogens on this side as protons. Okay. So now that we've got um, everything but oxygen, hydrogen, then oxygen, then hydrogen. Now we want to uh, we have to balance the um, electrons. Since the electrons uh, in either case are associated with the element that was oxidized or reduced, this one did not change because we did not change the number of sulfurs. So it's still two electrons lost by sulfur. So for this one, two chromiums at six plus each and three electrons going from there to there, three electrons twice, right? So if we have three electrons lost per chromium, that means we need six electrons. Three for one chromium, three for the other. So that might be a tricky place where you have to be sure that your the electrons transferred match up with the oxidation states of the uh, of the element oxidized or reduced, whichever the case may be. <clears throat> Now we've got the electrons balanced. <coughs> we need to recombine the equations. And in order to recombine the equations, you have to be sure that the same number of electrons on the, pro uh, the reactant side are equal to the number of electrons on the product side. For the reduction here, we have six electrons. For the oxidation, we only have two. So we've got to multiply the entire equation through by three give us six electrons here. Right, that's six electrons. It also means three times two is six hydrogens, three sulfates, three waters, and three sulfides. Okay. Now that we've got the electrons balanced, we can add everything together. Okay. So we're going to have uh, one dichromate. Okay. Then we're going to have three sulfites. Then we're going to have three waters. Remember, the electrons go out. But of course, we want to remember, for purposes of, of other calculations, that six electrons are transferred for this reaction. But when we add them together, those, those electrons cancel. Three waters and 14 protons on the reactant side. On the product side, we have two chromium. Okay. We have three sulfates. We have seven waters, and we have six protons. Now we need to combine or cancel um, waters and hydrogen. We've got three waters on this side, seven on that side. So all of these are gone, and that leaves us with four on this side. Protons, we've got 14 on this side, six on that side. So these are gone. And it leaves us with eight on this side. So that's the balanced equation for that redox reaction. And these are the steps, slide by slide. And that's the balanced equation. That seems like a lot of work, and it is. But when you're presented with uh, a redox reaction, 
this is the only way you can balance it. So we try to use the old method for just balancing the equation in general. Sometimes you can get there and sometimes you can't. So if you've got a redox reaction, this is the best course because it'll, it'll avoid um, running down rabbit holes and dead ends. Okay. Now we've got another example here. And let's see if it's worth doing this one on the board. Yeah. Whenever you see um, an unbalanced equation and it's got oxygen in it, then you know you're going to have to uh, add water and add hydrogens to that one. So this is in acidic solution. Um, let's see, that's the balanced equation in acidic solution. I'm not going to go through the steps. But you break it into separate steps. Oh, and recall that any uh, element in sta at standard state, its redox, no, its uh, oxidation state is zero. So this bromine right here would be zero. So it went from minus one to zero, which means it lost an electron. So it's uh, oxidation is the bromine to bromine. That means this one, manganese to Mn2 plus, is the production. So you Break them apart, follow the steps, and you can't miss it. You have to be really methodical about this. Now, what do you do with a basic solution? I call it the fake acid method. <clears throat> you balance your equation in acidic solution first, and then you make the adjustment for the basic solution. Right, so that's what those steps in green are all about. And what we need is an example. Okay. Here we go. We're going to balance this one for a basic solution. Right. So I'll go through this one complete from end to end. Uh, cyanide ion. And manganate ion. Yield. Uh, I'm not sure what to call that one. I'm sure it has a name. Escapes me for the moment. Uh, manganese for oxide. That's a solid. Okay, so we need to do oxidation states first. Um, nitrogen is where I would start. Nitrogen is minus one, minus two, minus three. So minus three for that one holds uh, one out for the charge. That means that carbon is two plus. This oxygen is minus two, so that's minus eight total. Hold one out, minus seven. That makes this manganese seven plus. Um, let's go over to this manganese for now. Minus two, minus four. We don't have to hold a charge out. So this one is balanced by the plus four. Uh, this one, minus two here. And uh, hmm. I would probably go to minus three for that one. So that's minus five. Hold one out, minus four. This one's four plus. So let's see if that matches. We're going from plus seven to plus four on manganese. So that's a reduction. We're going from two plus to four plus on carbon. That's an oxidation. Okay. We generally save carbon for last in one of these situations. So that's why I went oxygen and then uh, minus three for nitrogen to find out what carbon was. 
Okay, so oxidation, reduction. The oxidation state, oxidation is loss. So we're going from uh, two plus to four plus. That means cyanide ion here. And whatever this ion is, four plus. And that means that it's lost two electrons per carbon. And this one is manganate minus good, uh, seven plus going to MnO2, which is four plus. So that means we had to add three electrons here per manganese. Okay. Now we balance everything that's not oxygen or hydrogen. Uh, the oxidation equation is fine. The reduction equation is fine for manganese. So now we go to oxygen. We have one oxygen on that side and one on this side. And this one, we have four oxygens here and two oxygens there. So we need two more oxygens on this side. Two waters. Okay. Now we have to balance the hydrogens. Right? So this one's got two hydrogens on this side. We put two protons on this side. And this one has um, four protons on that side. So we need four protons. Now, we need to balance the electrons. All right, we've gone from this one carbon to that one carbon with two electrons, so that's fine. We don't have to change that. We didn't change the number of carbons there. We didn't change the number of manganese atoms here. So the number of electrons are fine the way they are. Now what we do is match the number of electrons for each reaction so that we can combine them. But this one's got an even and that one's got an odd. We can't multiply just one kind of something and get uh, the right number. So when you have an even one and odd the other one, the best way to handle it is cross multiply. This three comes up here. And that two comes down here. Okay. So let me make some more room here. I should have done that. Okay. So this three is multiplied by that, by that, by that, times this, and times this. We use that three. Use this two, two there, six there, eight here, two there. And four here. We put that. And now we can combine them because the number of electrons are the same on both sides. But before we do, why don't we cancel some things? We've got three waters on this side, four waters on that side. So these three go out and leave us with just the one. Hydrogens. We've got eight hydrogens here, six over there. Those six hydrogens are gone and leaves us with two hydrogens on this side. Now we're combined. So we have three cyanide. I'm going to leave the, uh, the states out. Um, two MnO4 minus. Electrons are gone, and two hydrogens on that side. On this side, we have three CNO minus plus two MnO2s plus one water. Okay, so this would be balanced for an acidic solution, and you know because protons right here. So how do we get it to go 
from there to a basic solution, you neutralize all your protons with hydroxyls. So you add the same number of hydroxyls on either side. For this side, you need two hydroxyls. And H plus and OH minus together makes water. So what we have here is two waters. On this side, we have two hydroxyls. Because we added them on that side, we have to add them on this side. And we have one water on this side, two waters on that side. So now this one cancels and leaves us with one water on that side. So now we're in basic solution. And you know because you have the hydroxyl right here. So it should be 3CN minus, 2MNO4 minus, one water, three CNOs, two MNO2s, and two hydroxyls. Okay. So that's how you balance an equation by a half reaction method for basic solution. You make it acidic first, then you convert it to basic. Now, it's possible, although I haven't mastered the technique, it's possible to balance directly into a basic solution. But I'm a creature of habit. This way works for me. That's the way I use it. Okay, so let's see if we can move on. Now, uh, the thing about half reactions is we can combine them on the board and make up a, a combined redox reaction. But if you are trying to extract chemical energy and convert it into electrical energy, you've got to access those moving electrons somehow. If you just put them both together, those half reactions in a common solution in a beaker, they're going to react, but you won't have access to the electrons. So they're moving at the atomic level. So what you do is you separate the two reactions into separate containers. You only allow the transfer of ions and electrons through a controlled medium. The electrons move through an external wire, and the balancing uh, anions or cations in the solutions uh, are transferred through some sort of a bridge. And, to, and what you get as a consequence is what we call a galvanic cell, otherwise known as a battery. Um, now, when you put these two half reactions together, um, you expect the reaction to be spontaneous. Otherwise, what's the use? So this is what a galvanic cell might look like, two types. Um, it, this is not the only way to make um, a galvanic cell, but these are two common ways. Um, this is not the way you make one in your car battery, because in your car battery, you don't need the bridge. And I'll explain why later. But for the one we're going to make in the lab, we're going to use a salt bridge. And one of these reactions is the oxidation, place where oxidation takes place, and the other one's where reduction takes place. And um, you can connect the wires between the two, but if you leave the salt bridge out, no reaction occurs. The reason being that it's simple electrical theory. Electrons will not move unless they move in a circuit. You've got to have a connected circuit all the way around. It's like a, a snake grabbing onto its own tail. If it doesn't grab onto its tail, no electrons transfer. 
So that's why you need the salt bridge to make the connection, the electrical connection between the two cells complete. Right, so you transfer counter ions through here, you transfer electrons through the wire. Or if you have a porous disc, that works also. In fact, the porous disc is more efficient. You get some resistance to the movement of ions through a salt bridge. So the expected voltage that you would get from uh, a galvanic cell uh, should be less than you expect by using a salt bridge than if you use a porous disc. Okay, uh, definitions. So when we put the, um, uh, so we have the two separate beakers, and one of them we identify as the location where reduction takes place. That's called the cathode. So once you've identified reduction in one cell, call that the cathode, and the other one then where oxidation takes place is the anode. You can just memorize it, or uh, the way I look at it is the cathode, or by definition, is the site of reduction. Okay, so reduction takes place when you say this plus electrons yields something. That's reduction. <clears throat> Um, or we could say this, and it's positive there, and neutralized on that. This makes more sense to my explanation. <clears throat> so what happens? If you've got this container, and you've got some sort of conductor there for electrons to flow through to the other cell, but this one's the cathode, then to have our salt bridge. If this is the cathode, then which way are the electrons moving? If you're going to supply electrons on the reactant side, the electrons have to move that direction because they have to come out over here and combine with that. Okay? So the way I look at it is Remember the difference, uh, cations are positively charged, right? So the cathode is where the positively charged ions are attracted, right? You've got these electrons flowing out here. These positive ions are going to be attracted to them. So that's why this is the cathode, because the cation is attracted to it. That's the way I look at it. And then the anode is just the opposite. Okay. Now let's see what we can do with this. We want to be able to calculate the cell potential. So a, a galvanic cell battery is a combination of both a cation, a cathode, and an anode. This one has its half reaction. This one has its half reaction. Okay, but you combine them together, you get the galvanic cell. So the cell potential is what is the push behind those electrons? How strong is the push? The higher the voltage, the stronger the push behind the electrode, electron to flow from the anode to the cathode. And we measure that as um, cell potential, right? That's your cell potential. Or sometimes it's kind of hard to find that uh, font some places, the fancy E font. So sometimes I'll just do this. It means the same thing. So 
sometimes, well, it's E because it's also referred to as the right hand. Okay. And the unit of potential is the volt. The volt is also equal to one joule of work for every coulomb of charge transferred. So one joule of work for every coulomb. That big C means coulomb. Coulomb is a unit of charge that we inherited from the uh, early to mid 19th century. Um, it's, it's named after a scientist whose name was Coulomb. And it just represents an amount of charge. Right? It was, it's been established as a standard measure. And uh, the volt is based upon that. So if you have a, a higher voltage, you increase the voltage, that means the work goes up. Or if the work stays the same, the number of coulombs goes down. So the same amount of work will transfer a smaller amount of coulombs for one volt charge. Okay, let's No ions reduced by gaining electrons from electrical current in the electron. Electrons from electrical current in the electron. Metal atoms deposit on the cathode. Watch the gray metal ions in solution. At the cathode, metal ions reduce by gaining electrons from electrical current in the electron. Metal atoms deposit on the cathode as metal ions in solution move toward the cathode in a counter electron flow. So what that means is, if you have a cathode in solution, you've got electrons flowing in that direction, then some metal is in solution and it's being reduced, then it's going to deposit, well, not up there, but down here, it's going to deposit on that electrode. Now, that's not the case with every cathode, but in the case where you do have a metal uh, submerged in the cathode half cell, then uh, any reduction of the metal that's in solution will deposit on the cathode and the mass of the cathode will increase uh, as a consequence. This is at the anode, and conversely, if the anode is made up a, of a metal suspended in solution where electrons are being transferred out, that means whatever metal is on this anode are, being, uh, are losing electrons, so they become cations. In solution. That means under these circumstances, the mass of the anode will decrease. And theoretically, uh, if all of the anode is used up in the process of this reaction, the reaction stops. Okay, 
how do we measure potential? Well, there are two ways. And they're based on two different um, processes. Uh, one's called a volt meter. Probably the most common way to measure voltage. And what a voltmeter does is it introduces it introduces into the um, into the circuit okay it introduces into the circuit a known resistance So if we if we use um, Ohm's law, V equals I R. Actually, Ohm's law is written differently than that. It's usually written R equals V or I. Voltage and I means current. Right? And current is in amps. An amp equals uh, one coulomb of charge transferred per second, right? That's not important that you know now, but to understand how a voltmeter works, what we do is we introduce over here a known resistance, right? So if we know what the resistance is, then, and all we have to do then is measure the current because the current is related to the volts. So if we measure the current, we can infer the voltage. That's the way a voltmeter a potentiometer a potentiometer is actually better for measuring the maximum potential available from a cell when you start moving charges uh, then you lose efficiency remember when we when we talked about it in the last chapter Maximum efficiency or maximum um, work that can be obtained from any thermodynamic process is obtained when you're using a reversible reaction. That is, the reaction can go backwards and forwards, and that means we have very small increments just right there on the edge, backwards and forwards. The same type of uh, uh, principle is used for the potentiometer. So what you do with the potentiometer is you have a device um, in which you can adjust the voltage. So if the, if the electrons are moving this way, then your potentiometer uh, introduces a voltage in reverse. And when you, when you reach a zero point where the electrons are not moving, then that will give you the voltage that's required to oppose it, to set the current to zero. And at that point, you've reached the maximum cell potential because you're essentially at a reversible position. So while both of them give you the same output voltage, they operate on completely different uh, principles. All right. So we typically, well, when I was taking this course as a student, um, a digital voltmeters didn't exist. We had a, a voltmeter that with a analog dial. It was just a, it was a scale. Uh, you had a needle pointing to graduated scale. <laughs> so you had, to, you had to learn how to read off that scale. It was kind of a pain, really. Digital voltmeters take that guess out. They actually, it's, it's like the difference between an uh, analog watch with hands on it and a digital watch that gives you the time in uh, hours and minutes. 
but we're going to be using a digital voltmeter in the lab. Okay, I've got two that I use. Uh, one that I brought from home, and one that actually is, is the one that I used. I took a picture and put it in the net. Okay. So, <clears throat> the question may arise then, when you set up one of these galvanic cells, do you have to measure the voltage for every single possible combination cell that's made? And of course, if you know me, the answer is no, you don't. There's a way to calculate the voltage. You measure, you can measure the voltage, yes, for any cell, but maybe you want to know in advance what the expected voltage is uh, for safety reasons, or uh, say you need to study a process that produces at least a certain voltage. So you can do that calculation ahead of time. And then that also lets you know that when you build your cell, um, how efficient it is. Because you're expecting a certain voltage, only you get this much voltage. Less than that, that will tell you something about the efficiency of the cell. So how do we calculate that? Well, there are tables. There's a table in your text. Uh, at least for this version of the text, is table 18.3. And in order to do that, you cannot measure the cell potential of a standalone half cell. Remember? The reason you can't do a half cell by itself is reduction is always accompanied by oxidation. And a half cell is only half of that equation. So if you only have the half cell, you can't measure a voltage. You need a reference cell. So what we've done is established um, standard conditions right? for solutions. The standard concentration is one molar. And if your cell actually happens to introduce a gas into the process, that gas has to be at one atmosphere pressure. And then there's standard temperature, which is the same as, as all STPs um, at 25 degrees centigrade. So what's our standard cell? What do we compare the cells against? We compare them against the standard hydrogen electrode. And if you look at um, what was the next table, no, not that one. We're getting there. Um, there's our standard conditions. And there's this is the standard half cell, and it's arbitrarily set at zero. So the half cell potential <clears throat> is zero for that cell. So we can compare it against any one of these other cells and determine what the expected voltage will be. So all these reactions, and this is just a sample of reactions, there are literally hundreds if not thousands of half reactions that have been compared against the standard hydrogen electrode. But once you've got them compared against that standard, then you can compare them against each other. And these tables are written as reductions. Right? So all of these reductions and the associated voltage is given for the electrons on the reactant side. Okay? But we know already from balancing the, these equations that one of them is reduction and the other one is oxidation. So what do you do if you want to compare, say, let's see, today we're comparing... Uh, Not that copper, different copper. Yeah, this copper right here. Comparing that copper, copper two plus, reduced to copper uh, in this equation. And then we're comparing that against zinc. So I think zinc is on the next table. Uh, let's see, zinc, 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 zinc. There it is. Here it is, zinc. So they're both written as reductions. 
The question is, if you want a spontaneous reaction, which one's the oxidation and which one's the reduction? Right? So the zinc reduction is written at minus 0 0.76 volts. Minus 0 0.76 volts for the uh, zinc reduction. Plus two electron yields zinc metal. And then the copper is, I'll have to back up. Copper is 0 0.34. Okay, plus volts. So, how do you tell? Which one's oxidation, which one's reduction in a spontaneous cell? The answer is a combination that gives you a positive voltage. Positive voltage implies a spontaneous reaction. So, what do you do? Well, you need to know what to do with these values if you change this from, an from a reduction to an oxidation. Right? So what happens if you change this one to an oxidation? What happens to that voltage? If you flip it around like this, the sign on that value reverses. All right? So if you add those two together, this one plus this one, what do you get? get uh, zero and then one, 1 1.1 minus volts. So if we try to put the cell together as this one for the anode and this one for the cathode as its reduction, you don't get a sp spontaneous reaction because the, e the uh, electromotive force voltage is negative. So that means you have to do it the other way. You have to take this one and make it oxidation. Make it the anode. Okay, that makes this one positive. Okay, now if this one is the cathode and this one is the anode, Then when you add these two together, you get a positive 1.1 volts. That's the way you, you set up your half cell. This one has the anode, this one has the cathode. So this one stays the same as it is in the table. And this one has to be reversed. And whenever you reverse, you change the sign of the standard potential. So if we combine these two reactions, this one's got two electrons, and this one's got two electrons, we can add them together, right? We can add these two together, and we would get uh, Cu2 plus, plus zinc yield, Cu plus uh, Zn2 plus with an electromotive force potential of plus 1.1 volts. Okay? Now, before we can add these together, suppose that we didn't have the same number of electrons. We were combining a cathode and an anode with different number of electrons. Then you would have to multiply uh, one of them or both of them by some constant before you could add them together. What does that do to the potential, the value here for this, uh, the, the electromotive force? Nothing. It doesn't change it. Because these values are effectively intensity factors. In other words, it doesn't matter how many of each you have, the value stays the same. The only time you have to make a change is if you flip the reaction from reduction to oxidation, then you change the sign.
After that, you just add them together. You add them together, the, the way to tell which one is which is which one gives you the positive voltage. Okay? Now, I know your book, and I think I have a slide on it here, tells you to, to calculate the E of the cell. And by the way, these are standard potentials, right? So this is that little zero right there. That's a standard value. Under standard conditions, one molar concentration, um, 25 degrees centigrade, and one atmosphere pressure on the gases if there are. But we rarely ever construct a cell um, under standard conditions, right? So we need a way to calculate what's the actual voltage for the conditions, usually referring to what when you have concentrations of these soluble ions, that changes the actual voltage. So your book is gonna say the potential of the cell is the potential for the cathode minus the potential for the anode. Okay, and the reason they say minus anode is because everything is written as a cathode. So if you flip the cathode to be an anode, you have to change the sign, and that's why the minus sign. But if you do it up here first, like this, then you just add them together, because you've already introduced the minus sign in the sign change to begin with. Right? So if you can identify which is cathode and which is anode, go ahead and use that formula. I like this way better, because I never make a mistake to do it this way. Sometimes mistakes are inconsequential. Sometimes mistakes are massive. For instance, remember that Mars probe that was sent and it completely missed the planet? <laughs> That's because the engineers were doing their calculations. They received data from a partner in the metric system and they forgot to change it to the English system or vice versa. So they just lost that million, multi-million dollar probe and hopefully it's rolled. Okay, so these are examples, right? If, you, if you're going to uh, reduce iron and oxidize copper, then you look at the um, half reactions and iron written as a reduction is 0.77. Copper written as a reduction is 0.34. But in this case, copper is the anode. So we have to flip it. So that makes copper minus 0.34. You add them together, um, then you should get a positive voltage. So making copper the anode was the right thing to do for this spontaneous reaction in the... Uh, uh, combined cell voltage. All right. Now, <clears throat> for calculating the voltage, it doesn't matter how many electrons are transferred. But when we do calculations later, remember under non standard conditions, you have to know how many electrons are transferred. Okay. So if you're gonna combine these equations, then be sure that you know how many moles of electrons were transferred, in this case, two. Two moles of electrons were transferred. Keep that written down somewhere in the back of your head. Because if we're gonna do a calculation um, for determining the actual voltage, you've gotta know how many moles were transferred. And we do that with something called the Nernst equation. Nernst was a scientist. I guess he was proud of his name. That, it maybe it doesn't sound funny in German. It just sounds funny in English. Okay. 
So this calculation for determining the actual voltage of a cell using the Nernst equation, you need to know how many moles of electrons are transferred. Or if we're going to do some stoichiometry, right? We have a reaction and say we're gonna we're gonna start out with so much copper here, we will find out how much of copper metal can we plate out on some surface. Then you have to know how many electrons were transferred in order to do that. That's, these are the two cases where you need to know the number of moles that are involved in a reaction, either to calculate the actual voltage with the Nernst equation or to calculate stoichiometry. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see how we're doing on time. Two thirty. We're getting pretty. We're getting pretty close. Here we. Okay, we're we're, we're fine. All right. So sometimes it's uh, it's useful to understand. Um, amongst a set of elements or ions, which one is the stronger oxidizing or reducing agent? Of course, if you look at that table, then you can tell, let's see, let's back up, table, table, table. You can tell from this table, go back to this one, which one is the, um, uh, the stronger oxidizing agent. Equals the stronger oxidizing agent equals the more readily reduce, reduced agent. And the one that's more easily reduced will be a more, will be a stronger oxidizing agent, right? So for, for if you're just looking at this list, the larger, the more positive the number, if you compare two of them, the more positive the number, the more readily it is reduced. It makes it a stronger oxidizing agent. So let's say if we compare this uh, uh, fluorine to fluoride, uh, on this chart, it's the highest half cell voltage, 2.87. If we compare it to say copper, it's uh, like 2.7 volts difference. So this makes it a much stronger oxidizing agent than copper. It's a stronger oxidizing agent than anything on this table. If we were to compare two elsewhere, like this one and that one, this one would be a more, more a stronger oxidizing agent when you look at this part versus that part. So with that in mind, if we go to, uh, let's see, back to where we, we left off. Here we go. So if we're going to find out which of these, put these in order of strongest oxidizing agent uh, to least strong, then we need to know, we need to compare their uh, voltages, standard reduction potentials. So the largest positive standard reduction potential of this group is going to be the uh, strongest oxidizing agent. So here are the reduction potentials for components that are uh, here. So there's iron right here, but it's not exactly right, right? So that's empty. So that one has to be flipped. There's chlorine. It's the right direction. There's sodium and there's sodium ion. So we compare this one against that one flipped at plus 
And this one is, is written wrong. So we take it and flip it to compare the voltages. Right, so we flip that one. Okay. And we have these two right there. They're there. And we have, uh, okay, we got that one. Now we need the chlorine. Chlorine's okay because it's written correctly. And then iron. So then you just compare the voltages. So the strongest oxidizing agent is the one that's most readily reduced right here. Oh, no, excuse me, here, right? The fluorine, then the sodium, and then the chlorine, and then the iron, and then the sodium ion, and then the fluoride ion, in that order. Oh, we didn't need the, sorry, we didn't need the fluorine. We only needed the blue ones. That's why I color coded it. Okay. So, <clears throat> sometimes it's convenient to use a shorthand notation for writing out a, an electrochemical cell or a galvanic cell. We call it line notation. So, think back to our um, our uh, cell with its two beakers and its salt bridge. The bridge between the two is identified by a double line. And then whenever you have uh, a change in phase, you use a single line, something like that. And then you put things in here in a certain order Okay. This side has the anode. This side has the cathode. Okay. So you're going to have things set up so that reduction is shown on this side and oxidation is shown on this side with the salt bridge in between. So let's see if we got an example here. Uh, okay, there's the vertical line. Um, it's often wise uh, for completeness to list the concentrations. If you have aqueous solutions, actually write the concentrations in here wherever they happen to be. Right. Okay, for instance, so we have this magnesium change in phase from solid to aqueous. Okay, and then the salt bridge. And now on this side, we have cathode, so reduction. We take aluminum three plus, we inject electrons there, and we get aluminum metal. Okay. So the oxidation goes from zero oxidation state to two plus. That's, that's good. We're losing electrons, and here we're gaining electrons to go from three plus to zero. So that would be an example of line notation for that particular electrochemical cell or galvanic cell. So suppose you have a reaction where, um, say on the anode side, you've got an aqueous solution of one ion, an aqueous solution of the ion that's uh, a different oxidation state and the electrode inserted into the water does not participate in the reaction. All you need then is something that will conduct the electrons away because the anode is going to produce electrons right, and heads over to the cathode. So what you need is something inert that, that will not corrode and will not enter into the reaction. Um, a good choice is platinum. Platinum electrodes are frequently used as inert electrodes in that situation. <clears throat> Sometimes they use carbon because it's cheaper. In fact, the, um, 
the dry cell battery that you put in your radio or, or flashlight um, uses carbon in the center as an electrode, but the carbon does not participate in the reaction. Now, that battery will have the walls will be made of zinc, and then the center electrode will be carbon, and then this electrode does participate in the reaction, and then the, uh, uh, the rest of the reaction takes place in here, and the carbon electrode is there simply to conduct electrons. Okay, so that's what you do when, uh, when you need a, uh, an inert conductor that does not participate in the reaction. Um, so here's an example. We're gonna completely describe this galvanic cell. We have silver ions going to silver metal and uh, iron, three plus going to two plus. These are both written as reduction potentials so we have to decide which one's the anode and which one's the cathode. So what would happen if you flip this one? Makes that negative, but add them together and you get a negative value, right? So that's not gonna work. So you leave this one reduction and you make this one oxidation or the anode. That makes this one negative and the difference between them is 0 0.03 volts. Positive, that means the reaction is spontaneous. A positive voltage means spontaneous reaction. Okay. Well, okay, so uh, we wrote the reaction out. Now, do we need to do anything about the electrons? No. In the process, same number of electrons, both sides. So one mole of electrons was transferred in this reaction. Right, so we need to remember that for future calculations. And they should be coming up fairly soon, I hope. Uh, let's see. So this is what the cell would look like. And if we, if we write the cell with the convention of our line notation, the cathode beaker would be on the right and the anode beaker would be on the left. Okay, so in this case, the cathode or the reduction because the silver ion, we didn't change. Um, we went from uh, silver plus one to silver metal. So this one is the cathode, and then this one's the anode. And since this one has, uh, we're um, oxidizing Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus, the electrode surface does not enter into the reaction. So we need something inert, simply there to transfer electrons. And for this one, we use platinum. <clears throat> okay. Uh, all right, so this is sort of the summation. Um, and this would be a, a sketch. Right? So the electrons are being transferred from the anode to the cathode. We're measuring the voltage through an external circuit. It's what we'll do in the lab. Only we won't use silver and copper, we'll use zinc and copper for our battery. So here's an interesting question. For this particular reaction, we write out the, um, we have copper and silver. What happens if we start off by increasing the copper concentration. Right. So here's where you can apply Le Chatelier again. If we increase the copper concentration, and this is the anode, okay, so it's written as the copper metal yielding copper two plus ions plus electrons at the anode. Then if you increase the copper two plus concentration in solution, you're gonna drive the reaction backwards. So what you should do, what will happen in that case is the actual potential of the cell will be decreased because you're, you're pushing the reaction in the wrong direction. Um, conversely, 
if we decrease the copper concentration, right, it would promote a movement to the right. And that should increase the voltage of the cell. We're eventually going to get to the Murphy's equation. Let me see. Uh, Um, but before we get there, um, we need to have a short discussion about um, voltages, cell potentials, and work. Because we want to know how much useful work we can get out of any uh, completed cell. The relationship. Uh oh. What happened? Okay. I got it. I pushed the wrong button and erased it. So our um, uh, cell potential and work are going to have opposite signs because remember, everything is referenced to the uh, system. Surroundings, okay? <clears throat> so if if work is done on the system, it's positive. If work is done by the system, it's negative. Right? So that's what we want. We want the system to do work for us. So negative work is what we're looking for, and we want that to be spontaneous. So the relationship between a spontaneous reaction and work is opposite signs. And the relationship is, um, remember the definition of volts as joules per coulomb of charge transferred, right? So volt is our electrochemical potential, joules is work, and it has to be negative. Right? Because if it's going this way, we got to change the sign of this to make it compatible with um, a positive E value. And then C is the charge, which is Q. Now, uh, let's see. Q was, okay, we're using Q in a different way here. Remember when we were talking about thermochemistry? We call Q heat, right? In this case, Q is charge, right? Measured in Coulomb, charge in Coulomb. I know that can be confusing. So you always have to know um, which corral you're in as to which animal you're using. In this corral, Q means charge. In thermochemistry, Q means heat. Okay, but W still means work. So the maximum amount of work that you can obtain is by rearranging this, we would say uh, put Q over here, E times Q equals negative W, but we want W to be uh, a positive value. So we say W equals negative E times Q. That's the relationship between the maximum amount of work that you can get. Um, if this is max, then this is max. Now, how do we identify max voltage? We don't use a voltmeter because we don't want electrons to move. We use a potentiometer. Or we do a calculation using standard values. So the maximum amount of work you can get is the voltage minus the voltage times the charge that's transferred. Okay, now we're getting to knowing how many moles of electrons. But coulombs is not moles of electrons. We need to have a relationship uh, and equivalence between uh, coulombs and moles of electrons okay, in order to do that calculation. And here it is. 
we use the unit of Faraday. One Faraday is equal to um, 96,485 coulombs for every mole of electrons. Okay? That's the relationship. But one Faraday is equal to that power. Okay. Uh, now, remember I said uh, if the electrical potential, electrochemical potential, or electromotive force is positive, the reaction is spontaneous. So now we can say that if um, the maximum amount of work is also equal to a change in free energy, right? And that is equal to, by association, the uh, associative property, minus Q. So now we have a way to calculate the free energy of an electrochemical reaction. All we need to know is how much charge is transferred and what's the voltage. Right? So we can measure the uh, free energy of an electrochemical reaction if we know these values. Um, the other thing you can do, uh, this is moles of electrons, right, equals N. So if we solve this for, um, let's see, Q, right, this value here is charge, right, so F times the number of moles equals Q. So we substitute that in here, we can say, um, well, let's turn it this way. Minus 10F equals that. So now we have another relationship. The number of moles times the number of Faradays times the maximum voltage gives us an association with free energy or maximum work. Okay? And I think all of that information is, is included in the um, useful information at the back of the review. Let me check just to be sure. So we want that to be there for this. There's your standard reduction potentials. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Down at the bottom, bottom of the page, scroll across the bottom. It's all of those formulas. You just need to know how to use them. Okay. So under standard conditions, the free energy of the reaction is equal to minus the uh, number of moles times the Faraday's times the standard uh, electromotive force, standard potential. And that jives also with the fact that uh, um, a spontaneous reaction has a negative delta G. And the positive delta G is non-spontaneous, negative delta G is spontaneous. Okay. Now, one more discussion before we get to NERDS. And this is important for today because we're going to make two types of cells. One cell is going to be um, what uh, zinc and copper. Zinc is in one cell, copper is in the other. The other one is going to be a concentration cell in which we have exactly the same. I think it's based on copper. We have copper in both cells. And if, if, the, if we have
have copper in both cells and the solutions are in exactly the same concentration, then they're at equilibrium and you get no voltage. But if you have a different concentration in one cell than the other, you do get a slight voltage. And this is the explanation for it. Well, that's not the explanation. <laughs> We're going to go to the Nernst equation. I think we need the Nernst equation before we can uh, do any calculations for our concentration cells. <clears throat> also, the, uh, the document that I give you has a short discussion of the concentration cell. Let me just pull it back. Yeah, page two. Uh, yeah, it's on page two. Gives you a detailed discussion of concentration cell. Now for the Nernst equation. <clears throat> we want to be able to uh, calculate a standard potential. Now, derivation of this is not the easiest thing to do. So I think it's probably just as well that I just give it to you. Yeah. This was developed by was his first name? I just guess Gustav. I don't know. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. <clears throat> but the actual uh, electrochemical potential is equal to the standard potential minus these values uh, the gas constant times temperature. And I believe that temperature has to be. Usually it does have to be four. Yes. Oh, of course it does. Because the, the R is in joules per mole K. Uh, divided by the charge, NF, and then the natural log of the reaction quotient, not the equilibrium quotient. Reaction quotient Q. So these are actual concentrations before you even start the battery. Um, R then is the one with joules in it, 8.3145 joules per mole K. All right, so K will cancel this um, joules. Oh, moles. Moles will cancel with this. And uh, concentration is in, well, the Q is dimensionless. Uh, and you end up with, um, let's see, V equals, uh, what did I say before? Uh, joules. Or Coulomb. So we just need joules. We need out of this whole thing, we need joules per Coulomb as our unit of measure. So joules will come out of that one, Coulombs will come out of that one. Now that is the Nernst equation. But it's not the useful form of the Nernst equation. The useful form of the Nernst equation occurs at 25 degrees centigrade. And with natural log, I mean, uh, excuse me, common log, not natural log. So we make a conversion. And these are the steps, right? You change this 25 degrees plus 273. There's your temperature. Uh, there's your conversion for F, your uh, Faraday's, and we leave the moles alone. 
and we make this conversion for the log, the natural log. So 2.3026 times log equals the natural log. And I've got a little inset on the other side there to, to prove it, okay, if you're interested. But once we combine all these, we're left with the Q and the number of moles. So that N is the number of moles of electrons transferred in the reaction. That's the number that you need to remember from your balance equation. How many electrons are transferred? So you'll need that value, plus you'll need the standard potential, and then you'll need to calculate the Q. So in order to do the Q, you have to have the combined equation, right? Because Q is um, products over reactants. So once you calculate that, then you need the number of moles of electrons transferred and the standard electrode potential. Then you can find out what the actual potential is. Okay. So under what circumstances? Let's see. Um, this then would, would now be at 25 degrees C. This would be Standard potential minus uh, 0 0.0591 over mole times the common log of Q. Okay, so that's the one we're going to use. Now, what happens? Excuse me. What happens to your cell if it's at equilibrium? cell reaches equilibrium, there's no voltage, right? There's no reaction taking place, so you get no voltage. It's like uh, delta G of a reaction at equilibrium is zero. So this value then becomes zero at equilibrium, right? So then we have this one minus this one, there, right? But if it's at equilibrium, what do we substitute for Q? K, right? Equilibrium has the K. This is not equilibrium, this is equilibrium. So now that we know that, we can say that um, standard potential then is uh, oh this came over here as minus so if this comes over here minus and that's minus then we just make both of them plus right. so at equilibrium if we find out what the K is, we can determine what the voltage, standard voltage should be. Or if we know what the standard voltage is and we know how many electrons, how many moles of electrons are transferred in the reaction, we can calculate what K is. So now we have a way to find out what K is. Um, like we did earlier, we could find out what uh, delta G was. But this way, now we can use um, electrode potential to find out what K is for the electrochemical process. Uh, let's see. Equilibrium constants from cell potentials. Okay, so here's an example. We have this reaction. We subdivide it into um, half reactions, right? Now, which one's going to give us a positive value? I think if we make this one the anode, then that'll give us a positive value. Plus, we need to match the number of electrons. So we have two moles. So N, in that case, is going to be two. And the standard potential is going to be 0.67.
Okay? So we have this value and we have that value. We can find out what K is. That's all we need to know. Just do the calculation. And we find out that K, well, log K is 22.6. And well, K then is 4 times 10 to the 22nd. Did I do that right? Let me go back. 22.6 log k. Yeah. So 10 to the 22.6 is k by the definition of logs. Okay? So that's a very, very high k value, which means the reaction is going to be very strongly driven toward products as written. Um, for a positive voltage. Okay. This is just concept checks. Explain the difference between E and E0. E0 requires that um, all the condition, con, uh, conditions are standard. Uh, when is E equal to zero? Standard potential is equal to zero when? At equilibrium. That otherwise known as a dead battery. When is E zero equal to zero? It's only equal to zero for a concentration cell, right? Because a concentration cell has the same anode, same reaction in the anode as the cathode. Remember, it doesn't matter what you multiply them by. When you add them together, you get the same reaction on both sides. So there's, there's no uh, standard potential for a concentration cell. The only potential for a concentration cell is in the difference in concentration. And that's the calculation of the value Q. So if you have different concentrations, that gives you a different Q value. And the, the, the E0 value is still zero. Um, and this is uh, that's, uh, 0 0.05. So if this is zero for a concentration cell, this depends entirely upon these two values. How many electrons are transferred and what's the Q value calculated from their concentration? And typically, the potential for a concentration cell is, is very, very low, measured in millivolts. So when we set up the concentration cell in the lab, you have to change the scale on your voltmeter to measure millivolts instead of volts. If you set it on volts, um, it won't even pick it up. Okay. Uh, let's see. This is an exercise in sketching out this cell. If the nickel electrode is at this concentration, then that's the reduction potential. And silver is this reduction potential. Which one's going to be the cathode? Which the anode? Well, if we make this one the anode, it's going to make the, the total negative. So this one has to be flipped to be the anode. So the nickel cell is going to be the anode. It'll be on the left. The silver cell will be the cathode on the right. Here we go. There's your silver cell. There's your nickel cell. And the standard potential is going to be 1.03 volts. Okay, other types of batteries. We won't spend a lot of time on this. I just wanted to make the point. Um, when we set up uh, a, this cell in the laboratory, we need a salt bridge because the two half reactions have nothing in common. Their reactions are independent of one another. The only connection they have is the transfer of electrons. 
whereas a, um, a lead acid battery under the hood of your car, the solution, the electrolyte we call it, into which the, the anode and the cathode are submerged is common to both, the sulfuric acid. So in that case, you don't need a bridge. Oops. So here's your electrolyte. Since the electrolyte is common to both and participates in both reactions, in one, you make the, uh, the, the lead here is converted to lead sulfate. Uh, let's see, get this right. And the other one, the lead oxide, is converted to lead sulfate. And you have the sulfuric acid in common. It doesn't matter. The lead sulfate is deposited upon the lead oxide plates. The lead sulfate, these are uh, insoluble. The lead sulfate is also deposited on the lead plate. So when you run the current reverse, you reverse the reaction, you drive it backwards. And that's why, how you recharge your battery. You drive this reaction back here, you drive this one reaction back here, and recreate the lead and the lead oxide on the individual plate. The problem is that that reverse reaction is not 100% efficient. So you always leave a little bit of lead sulfate on the plate every time you recharge it. In the beginning, it doesn't matter because there's lots of surface area there for, for um, the desired reaction to take place. But eventually, you will so completely coat those plates with lead sulfate that you cannot reverse the reaction because they no longer have access to the solution. Well, in that case, the battery's dead, it's unusable, and it's said to be sulfated out. Another type of dry cell, okay, here's the cathode, but the cathode here does not participate in the reaction. It's just a graphite rod, and it serves as an inert uh, conductor of electrons. So the anode reaction takes place here at the zinc liner and transfers those electrons uh, by way of an external circuit back here to where it can be incorporated into the uh, cathode reaction. Mercury batteries, they're not used much anymore for obvious reasons. <clears throat> the hydrogen oxygen fuel cell is an interesting concept, and it's it's still uh, a galvanic cell. The nice thing about a fuel cell is you never run out of reactants. You just keep supplying hydrogen from one side, oxygen from the other, and the reaction taking place here delivers uh, electrons into an external circuit. And the only product is water. They run pretty hot, so actually it's steam. That's been one of the problems in, in making fuel cells available to the general public, is they have to run so hot, they're hazardous. So they use them in very limited, uh, specialized circumstances. One of the first was in, uh, uh, in the space program. So when the Mercury Gemini and Apollo, and then later the uh, uh, space shuttle astronauts went up. They carried with them fuel cells because they already had uh, oxygen for breathing. All they needed was a fuel, so they had, took hydrogen with them also. And they produced all the power they needed, you know, unless you were aboard Apollo 13 or the tank blew up, then you were your big trouble. Now, um, other electrochemical processes, corrosion. Let's see, what am I doing? 320. Go ahead. I think 
I had to finish this up with, uh, with a few minutes to spare. Corrosion is a process that converts a metal into uh, some other form. The metal is the desire, usually the desirable form. So we convert uh, iron oxide in the ore to iron. That's an electrochemical process. But um, in out exposed to the elements, iron will react with oxygen again spontaneously and produce iron oxide, rust. That's a form of corrosion, but it's not the only form of corrosion. That's specific to iron is rusting, but other types of corrosion are there. Uh, if you have uh, anything made out of zinc or magnesium perhaps, it's exposed to the air or buried in the ground, it will corrode, it will produce the oxide of those metals. But that's not necessarily a bad thing because if you connect those uh, corroding metals, they are more active than iron in its corrosion process. And you can sacrifice those electrodes, zinc or magnesium electrodes, and trickle electrons into the iron so that it will not corrode. So you sacrifice one electrode to save another. Um, think ocean going ships, they usually have a, a band of zinc wrapped around their hull below the waterline. And that is used to, to trickle electrons into the hull and keep it from rusting. Because paint only goes so far and you get barnacles on them chipping away the paint and uh, the paint flakes off and you get metal exposed. So if you have that sacrificial electrode, the zinc, it will provide electrons to the iron and keep it in the metallic state. Now, in order, zinc is not cheap. So in order to uh, save the zinc, as long as the engine, the, the ship is under power, it will provide electrons from its power source, its generators, into that zinc band so that the zinc doesn't corrode either. It's only when the, the engines are shut down, um, say it's, it's docked somewhere. So while it's docked, the engines aren't running and you're not providing any trickle electrons into that zinc band, the zinc band then sacrifices itself. Okay, this is an example of a sacrificial electrode. Magnesium is more reactive. It's a better oxidizing agent than um, iron. So it sacrifices itself as the anode and provides electro electrons to the buried pipe and keeps it from corroding. Now, these reactions, I, I referred to it a little earlier. They run spontaneously in one direction. But sometimes we'd rather run them in backward, in backward direction. And that's a process called electrolysis. In order to, to run a reaction in, in reverse, you need to supply a voltage in the opposite direction that's greater than the voltage in the spontaneous direction. Right? So if, you're, if your voltage is 1.1 volts spontaneous, then you need to provide 1.1 plus volts in the other direction to get the reaction to go backward. Okay? You need to provide a bigger push in the other direction. And uh, one way that that's used, uh, not so much anymore, but used to be bumpers on cars were steel, but steel, of course, corroded. And painting the bumpers didn't last very long. So they came up with a process called chrome plating. And it made nice, shiny chrome bumpers. It was cheaper than making them out of stainless steel. Uh, and it served the same purpose. Unless you were a uh, DeLorean, and then you made your whole car out of steel, stainless steel. Um, and then you go bankrupt. Unless, of course, you were into selling coke. Not get caught at it, but you did. Anyway, <clears throat> so the electrolysis process uh, runs the reaction in reverse. And if you know uh, the 
that the reaction will run in reverse, you give it enough voltage, and you measure how many moles of electrons are being transferred in that process, then you can use the stoichiometry of the reaction to determine how much, in this case, chromium, you can take from solution and plate it out on the electrode. So here's what you need to know. In order to run electrolysis and do the calculations, you need to know what's the current. How many coulombs per second? And how long does it run? That's the first step. Then with that, you can calculate the quantity of charge in coulombs, right? Because time times coulombs per second gives you number of coulombs. But the stoichiometry is not based on coulombs, it's based on moles. So you need to use that conversion from coulombs to moles to give you the uh, number of moles of electrons that, are, that go into the reaction. Then you use your stoichiometry conversion factors to find out uh, how much metal can be plated out with that many moles of electrons. And then you can convert that mole to gram, just like any other stoichiometry. Uh, let's see. This just this is discussion of the the charge. I mean the uh, the unit conversions to be sure our units are correct. And here's an example. You can also use this to determine what's the metal. Right. So if we're going to determine what's the metal, we can't use any of this information to give us the atomic weight, right? But we can find out what's the uh, molar mass. If you know how many grams of metal are plated out and how many moles that represents, you can find out what the metal is. Right? So this unknown metal, it took 52.8 seconds for a current of two amps to plate out 0 0.0719 grams of metal from a solution containing uh, manganese nitrate. Uh, EMN, metal nitrate. I don't know if it's manganese. So there's how long, and there's the amperage, so we can find out how many coulombs. Right? So, come on, here we go, Oops, I went too far. So here's the, the reaction. So in solution, you've got an MN3 plus that's gonna go to metal. So there's the stoichiometry right there. So it's three moles of electrons to make one mole of metal. So now we find out uh, two amps is coulombs per second. I showed you that a little earlier. So that times the time gives us how many coulombs, then times this conversion factor gives us the moles of electrons, and then this converts to moles of metal. So there's your moles of metal, and here's the mass of the metal that was produced, grams per mole. So we plate that out, 197 grams per mole says that it's gold. So this process is probably used to plate out gold on cheap jewelry. That's a very thin layer of gold, which looks nice, but um, if you wear it too often, it, you get right down to the metal underneath it, which is usually sterling silver. But it's very noticeable. Uh, okay, so um, if we wanna know what order these metals will plate. Remember, the, the way to run the reaction in reverse is to exceed the voltage in the reverse direction. Right? So we need to know the voltages that will reduce these metals. Right? So the reduction potentials are here for each one. There's copper, there's lead, tin, nickel, and zinc. Okay. So the one that plates out first is the one that requires the least voltage. Okay. So to reverse the voltage here, well, actually to exceed the voltage would be 0.16 volts would plate that one. 
whereas this one would require uh, actually 0.76 in reverse. You're telling me. The more positive the reduction potential plates first as the voltage is increased. Because this is a negative voltage, this is not spontaneous that direction, and we want it to go that direction. Right? So if the spontaneous is in the reverse direction, we've got to exceed that voltage. And we have to exceed this one. So this is going to plate last. It's the most negative. This one actually will plate spontaneously. This one requires a voltage of excess of 0.13, greater than 0.14, greater than 0.23, to make them plate. Okay, commercial electrolytic processes. Uh, let's see. I'm about, I'm about to We're close to the end. Production of aluminum is an electrolytic process. There's a reason that Alcoa aluminum was established uh, in, uh, I suppose, in Pennsylvania. Because lots of cheap coal, easy to make, cheap electricity. Right, that's the key, cheap electricity. Um, they also moved plants into Tennessee. Once the Tennessee Valley Authority got its dams up and running, they made a series of dams on the Tennessee River. Hydroelectric, I mean, if the government's going to build a dam and then sell the electricity, it doesn't care about a profit. It just wants to move the engine to do it. So they can sell electricity at a loss since the public is subsidizing it. So these industries moved into those areas because the electricity was cheap. Now, the original, the original um, impetus for the Tennessee Valley Authority was not industry. It was to electrify rural um, Tennessee and northern Georgia and some of Mississippi, Alabama, not Mississippi, Alabama. Um, but they could, the industry was drawn in too, and that, that helped the whole area. But of course, when you build a dam, you flood somebody's property. So that cost money too. Anyway, we can purify metals. Right? If you know the voltage of each of the metals, you can run the voltage to a, the exact point where you need it to exceed it just a little bit, and you can plate out just one of those metals. And then once you've got all that metal out, you can increase the voltage, plate out the next metal. So you can separate metals using electrolysis. Um, the purification of copper, in order for copper to be used in uh, electrodes or power lines, it has to be very pure, 99.99%. The only way to do that is through electro electrolysis. That's the last step in the refining of copper for that purpose. Um, this one is big. Electrolysis of sodium chloride. If you electrolyze sodium chloride, you make sodium metal and chlorine gas. And those are industrial products that are used in massive quantities. Um, sodium, to make sodium hydroxide, caustic soda. Uh, chlorine, um, you can use it straight chlorine in, in many uh, organic chemistry processes, or you can convert it into bleach. Uh, let's see. Um, have you ever taken um, silver flatware? They don't use it much anymore. It used to be uh, waiting boots. They did. Complete set of silver flatware. <clears throat> Along with your china, that type of thing. But over time, they were corroded. Like silver would, would get marked. That surface layer of corrosion. And the way to get rid of it was. <clears throat> All you needed was something that was more corrosive, more corrodible than your silver. Now, you didn't do it this way. All you had to do was uh, 
had a pan, lined it with aluminum foil, which is a stronger oxidizing agent than aluminum, and then a little bit of salt for conduction purposes, conduct electricity. And then just lay your the flatware down there touching the aluminum. The aluminum will corrode uh, almost before your eyes. And the silver flatware will become bright shiny again. So that's, that's, that's a bit amazing for me. You just have to find the silver flatware. Or if you have silver jewelry, do the same thing. Uh, okay, that's enough. We need to get in the lab. Okay. Is uh, Julianne still there? Well, I'm going to end the meeting. Okay. Oh, I'm here. Okay. I'm going to end the meeting and um, um, we won't have time for a review. All right. So you'll have to go and use the review documents and the review video that I made last spring. Okay. Okay, they're, they're both there uh, on Blackboard, and this one will be on Blackboard shortly. Okay. Uh, and then I'll see you guys. Um, well, I'm not finished with you yet, <laughs> but uh, um, I'll see you and Tyler um, with Megan next Monday for the last exam, and it'll just be on this one chapter. Okay. Okay. Have a good one. You too. Bye.